Well, good morning. <clears throat> Greetings of love in the name of our Lord, our, our, our Savior, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus. It's a real blessing to be able to be here. And I uh, trust that in some way we might be able to <clears throat> learn something that will help us in our walk with, uh, with Christ. Guess I'll give the, well, before, before I give that, uh, the, whoever's leading the singing, uh, at, the end, at the end, the last song, if you could sing number 508. So I'll just throw that out now so that you, <clears throat> so that you have that. The title of the message is Consecration, a Living Reality. Uh, I'll be up front with you. Some of this message I uh, shared a number of years ago. So if some of it sounds a little familiar, why that's, that's the reason. But <clears throat> uh, some of it will, I have as well as, as ch changed as well. <clears throat> Most of my thoughts will come from 1 Chronicles 29, but uh, we'll be looking at another chapter uh, before that. Second Chronicles, or I'm sorry, First Chronicles 29 has the, has the account of David uh, wanting and desiring to build a house for God. Uh, a place where God could dwell and stay among his people. And <clears throat> the question is, what was God's answer to, to David? Uh, let's go to second, first, I'm sorry, I don't know why I keep saying second. First Chronicles 17. And um, to get a, uh, a background here of what is um, happening. Uh, chapter 17, verse 1. Now it came to pass when David was dwelling in his, in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under tent curtains. Then Nathan said to David, do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. But it happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to dwell in. For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up Israel, even to this day but have gone from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another. Wherever I have moved about with all Israel, have I ever spoken a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and have made you a name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people, Israel. Also, I will subdue all your enemies. Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house. And it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you, and who will be, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. We'll stop right there. We see that God said no to David's desire to build a house for God. And we know that God cannot be contained in anything, in a, in a, in a building. But, but uh, David, 
here he was in his own house of cedar, and he's saying, Lord, you're still dwelling in a tent. That can't be right. Something is backwards. Something is wrong with that picture. But God said, no, you are a man of war. I am using you to prepare the way for your son to build this house. You know, all these other nations need to be subdued and conquered so that the building of my house can be done in peace. And we know that actually happened. The question is, what was David's response? And, and I, I want you to somehow get a hold of this thing of what our response needs to be uh, to the uh, things that God asked us to do. Did he go off into a corner and, and pout? You know, Lord, just look what all I have done for you. Look at all my conquests, my good leadership. I, I've been a tremendously good leader among the children of Israel. My ability to discern between right and wrong, my fearlessness in the face of the enemy, and the children are familiar with the uh, David and Goliath just as a young man, seem to be fearless. <clears throat> you know, I, I, was, I was fearless. I'm, I'm just trying to think of what David could have said. In the face of, why, oh, why can I not build this house for you? Why, Lord, let me build this house? That was not his response. I, I'm, I'm really amazed at that. No, he did not do this. He did not question the word that Nathan gave him from the Lord. And let's read the rest of chapter 17. And that will give you a, a um, beautiful picture of the response of David to this, uh, to God's answer. Instead of going into a corner and pouted, pout, it says in verse 16, then King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O God, and you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while, to, great while to come and have regarded me according to the rank of a man of high degree, O Lord God. What more can David say to you for the honor of your servant? For you know your servant. O Lord, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness in making known all these great things. O Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, Israel, the one nation on the earth, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for yourself a name by great and awesome deeds, by driving out nations from before your people, whom you redeemed from Egypt? For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. And now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, let it be established forever and do as you say and do as you have said. So let it be established that your name may, may be magnified forever, saying the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel is Israel's God. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O oh my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. Therefore, your servant is found, has found it in his heart to pray before you. And now, Lord, you are God and have promised this goodness to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue before you forever. For you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. I, I just love that, that response. And because of, you know, and God didn't just brush it off. You know, oh yeah, that was a nice response, David. He honored that response of David's by doing what? Because of David's response, God said he was going to build David a house. It's amazing. But it was one that was going to exist how long? Forever. Now, we know that David died 
we know that he uh, passed away. So how could this be that God was going to build David a house that would exist forever? Of course, <clears throat> that was finally through who? Did, through who did he really build David a house that exists forever? Obviously, it's Jesus Christ. And if you go to Luke, the, uh, the account of Christ's birth, <clears throat> it says, well, I'll just turn to it real quick. It mentions David there in verse, <clears throat> verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. There you see this house continuing to be built for David. All because of his response to what God said. No, you're not going to build me a house. Sorry. It just, you're not going to do it. <clears throat> and so God promised David that he would build him a house that will exist forever. And of course, it was through the Lord Jesus Christ that he finally did that. Well, David st still wanted to, I mean, he, he didn't lose that desire to want to build God's house. He didn't lose that. And let's go to chapter 29. And that, this chapter really reveals uh, David's heart in this whole matter. His heart was so into this house being built for God that he totally pulled out all the stops and made sure that Solomon had all the resources he would need to build this house. <clears throat> I'm going to take the time to read the whole chapter because it's, it's just so, so full, so beautiful. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, my son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great because the temple is not for man but for the Lord God. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might gold for things to be made of gold, silver for things of silver, bronze for things of bronze, iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones, and marble slabs in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver. 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses, the gold for things of gold, the silver for things of silver, and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. Who then, is, this is where my title comes from, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? Then the leaders of the fathers' houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with the officers over the king's work, offered willingly. They gave for the work of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord into the hand of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord, and King David also rejoiced greatly. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, O God, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. 
But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you as were all our fathers. Our, our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure and uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now with joy I have seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to you. O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of their heart of your people and fix their heart towards you. And give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes and to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Now bless the Lord your God. So all the assembly blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed their heads and prostrated themselves before their Lord and the king. And then we know uh, Solomon was anointed uh, king over there, king at that point. In verse 3, it, it talks about, David said, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given my given to the house of God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. I, I really like that word affection there uh, because I have set my affection. <clears throat> and that word has the idea of, of a delight or pleasure. This was, this was David's delight and pleasure to be able to give to the building of this house, even though he was not going to be around to participate in, in this build, building. And then in verse 5 and 6, it talks about the people uh, giving willingly. And I was really impressed with that word as well. That word willingly means without reserve, with joy, wishing you had more to give. And uh, it's important to remember to take note the word will is in this word. And uh, to me, it's submitting your will to a will that is greater than yours and being willing to be obedient to that greater will. In other words, they, are, they willingly gave it. There was no holding back whatsoever in uh, sharing <clears throat> and putting into the, uh, into the uh, money thing to help to build this house. But then when we look at, at the uh, verse 5 there at the end of verse 5, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? And David, by example, showed what this is all about, how, how to uh, <clears throat> consecrate yourself to, to the work of the Lord. That word consecrate has the idea of to, to fill, to be full of, it also it means the open one or the open hand. And if so if you put out your hand and it's open, what can you do with that? You could come up here and put a piece of an apple in my hand, right? You could put it in my hand. It's open. <clears throat> Consecration is an act of us choosing to open our hand to allow God to fill it with what he knows is best for us. And then, they, then give back to him a gift out of the resources he has given us. I, I guess as I think of this, I, I really want to challenge all of us and beg of you never to close your hand. What, what does a closed hand make?
What does that represent? Pardon me? Stubbornness. Stubbornness. A fight. It's a fist. Usually what are fists used for? Someone said a fight. But it's a sign of what? Rebellion. I am not going to open my hand and let you put anything in it, God. Because I don't want, I don't know what you're going to put into it, so I'm going to just close it. I'm going to close my hand instead of opening it up and allowing you to put something into my hand. I'm going to close it in rebellion against what you want, want to do, do with my life. We're actually telling God, I'm going to resist your will and take my own way. I think it was back in the 60s. I don't know if it was the Olympics or, or not, but these uh, men, um, I don't know, when they, if you win, win a medal while you go on to a stand and they play your national anthem or something like that, but they raised their hands like this in a fist. I'm not sure, in the 60s, of course, was <clears throat> the years of rebellion and different things in, in our country. Yes, that is what consecration is all about. Being willing to open up your hand without knowing what God is going to put into it. <clears throat> What's so wonderful is you do not have to be afraid of what God is going to put into it because it's always going to be something that's good for you. It's going to be a gift that will bless you and will help you to, to serve him in a better way. Another word in verse 9. Then the people rejoiced for they had offered willingly because with a loyal heart. That word loyal. Uh, the old King James it says perfect or complete, full, made ready. These people uh, offered willingly because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. And King David also rejoiced greatly. How loyal are you to, to the Lord, to God? Well, let's look a little bit at, at, at how benevolent David was with, uh, with his, his uh, gifts. Uh, this gold and silver that David gave has a value of billions of dollars in today's economy. Personally, David gave 112 tons of gold and 262 tons of silver. The people gave 188 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, and 3,750 tons of iron. Now, gold, I know the, pr the price of gold probably changing daily. <clears throat> but what I come up with, gold at this point is $1,234.80 an ounce. So that would make it $19,748.80 per pound. Or $39,000,000. 497,600 dollars per ton. How many tons did David give? 112. Which makes it for 100 tons that gold is worth 3,949,260,000 dollars worth. And then if you add that on top of what the, what the people gave. I, it's almost hard to, to fa fathom the amount of money that was given toward this house that David wanted to have built and which Solomon did then build. 
You know, it was the best that he had to give. But what did David say in his, in his thanksgiving there in, in um, chapter 29? Where did it all come from? Where did all of his gold and his silver come from? God put it into his hand, didn't he? God put it into his hand. That's where it came from. Lord, I'm just willing to just open my hand again and let you take it. It's, it's yours. It's for you. <clears throat> Here was a man who by example showed what it means to consecrate oneself to God. I am not going to use this wealth that I have for myself. Yeah, we know that David built a house. And we know Solomon did too. And, uh, <clears throat> but he was referring to the, this magnificent building where God could dwell. Yield up his gifts to the one who gave it in the first place. And uh, truly that is consecration. That is consecration. This account brings out the New Testament truth that there are only two ways. Consecration or desecration. And we know if you desecrate something, you violate the sanctity of it, profane it, make something of lesser value. That's what you do when you desecrate something. You make it of you try to make it as of less value as, as you possibly can. Well, what is the house of God today? <clears throat> David wanted to build this house for God, and he willingly gave, the people willingly gave of all their resources, of, of the gifts that God had given them. What is the house of God today? What is the king building today? You know, it was a king that built the house of God, and we also have a king that is building his house. Building his house. This house, I believe this morning, strongly believe this morning is the church. Jesus is our king, and he is building his church, the place of his abode. Matthew 16, 18 says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, there is nothing, not even hell itself, can stop <clears throat> this house from being built. The question is, the question for myself and for all of you this morning is, are you going to consecrate yourself to the building of this great house by giving back to Christ the gifts he has given you? Lord, I open my hand to allow you to fill it with what you see as best for me and then choosing to use that gift in a way that helps to build this great house, which is the church. And I, I guess I'm, I'm humbled when I think of the fact that when we think of the church and the, and the tremendous building that it is, that Christ would use us to build his church. That is humbling. And it's an amazing, it's, to me it's an amazing reality. He has all the resources to give us to do the job. So what, what are we waiting on? Why do we hold back? Why do we put our fist up and say, no, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. What, what's going on? I'm going to use a little illustration here as far as, as um, and, and as you all know, I'm no artist, but anyway. And this is the ground level. Now, underneath here, we have they're supposed to be roots. 
Now, how many of you, if we go out there, we see all those trees up along our property there. What do you see? Yeah. Why do you see the trunk and the leaves? Which was first? <laughs> I know all, most illustrations break down to a certain extent at, at some point. <clears throat> when the roots of trees, and, and we're thinking more of a forest, a forest here, more so because I'm not sure about these trees out here. <clears throat> but in a forest, especially, when the roots of trees touch, there is a substance present that reduces competition. In fact, this unknown fungus helps link roots of different trees, even of dissimilar species. A whole forest may be linked together. If one tree has access to water, another to nutrients, and a third to sunlight, the trees have the means to share with one another. Like trees in a forest, Christians in the church need and support one another. How many of you see the roots? There are some roots that come up above ground. I, I understand that. Why are those trees standing out there? Because of the roots. Because of the, uh, of the nutrients and the water and the sunlight that comes up through those roots and, and they share with one another. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know that until I, I did a little study in here and that's, that's an amazing concept. Never really realized that. <clears throat> but that's how we need to build the church of God, the church. Everyone doing their part, you know, intermingling with each other giving each other encouragement and strength and help and the nutrients that it needs to grow. <clears throat> well, 1 Corinthians 12, we know, gives us a list of, of these gifts, of some of the gifts that Christ has given to the church. And I'll just read 1 Corinthians 11, or I'm sorry, 12, <clears throat> 1 to 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but the one and the same Spirit works all these things, distri distributing, I'm sorry, to each one individually as he wills. Can you see all this? In those verses? <laughs> Just read them and, and, and let, it, let it speak to you. Listen. To another faith, to another gifts of healings, to another working of miracles, to another discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, all working together. Those roots are just helping each other. Amazing thing. And what will come out from that is a beautiful tree. 
and a beautiful church. <clears throat> My heart is to really, for us to take a real close look at that. What are you contributing to this building, to the building of this church? I'm not going to elaborate on each of these gifts, but, <clears throat> but only challenge us to use these gifts in a way that gives back to help build the church of Christ. You know, these gifts are priceless. I put a monetary figure on, on some of that gold and silver. But these gifts are priceless. They are, they are so valuable that no price can be applied to them. But yet, we can all have them. That's what's so amazing. We can all have them. We can all have them. Are you willing to use your gift of teaching to edify and build the church? Are you willing to share some wisdom with the church that Christ has shared with you? How about money? What are you doing with it? What are you doing with the money Christ has given to you? I wanted to uh, take special note there of, of verse 11 in 1 Corinthians 12. But the one in the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills. In the old King James, it says, uses the word divide. And really, when you think about division and distributing, I'm, you know, not a whole lot of difference there. But, um, but the, the, it, the, it distributes these gifts to each person. The spirit knows who can use this gift. It knows how, how you can... Uh, Take that gift and make something out of it for the, for the beauty of, of his church. You know, I was, I was thinking of, of uh, an example of playing a game with cards. I, not too long ago, some of the, the, the uh, grandchildren, the, the girls were at our place and they were playing a game with cards. You know, the, the cards are distributed among the players. We know, we know how all that works. They're face down. You don't see them until you pick them up, of course. You don't know which cards they are until you look at them. And you can hear the, oh, no, or yes, I got myself a good one. <laughs> I got myself a good hand here of cards uh, when the cards are looked at. You know, the Spirit knows what to give each person. May we always keep our hand open to the gifts that God wants to share with us, wants to give us. You know, I trust that no one here will ever play the game of open, open, and close. Open. No, I don't want that one. Oh, that might be okay. I'll open my hand to that one. No, no, not that one. Please don't do that. Because the Lord knows exactly which card, in a sense, that you need. And it will be good for you and will help you. <clears throat> There's another gift that I would like to share with you. It's not mentioned here necessarily uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 12 there. It's, it's the gift of sorrow. Um, and the gift of sorrow is, is a, a gift that, I'll put it my, in my, for myself, I want to do this. Does anybody like to go through sorrow? <laughs> How many of you are willing to open your hand to the gift of sorrow? And you're saying, you're calling it a gift? Sorrow, a gift? I think it's one of the greatest gifts that could, you could ever receive, really, as I think about it. <clears throat> Some of you are sorrowing the loss of loved ones very close to you. Quite a few of you are sorrowing with chronic health issues. Some of may, you may be sorrowing the loss of a close friendship. Uh, maybe sorrowing the loss of loved ones to the world. 
Uh, maybe a husband or wife that has decided to forsake the vows they made to you. That's a pretty sorrowful thing. The gift of sorrow is the one gift. Uh, again, as I said earlier, we are very quick to close our hand to, Lord, I don't want that one. No, no. I, I, I can't handle that one. I'm going to close my hand to that one. I don't want that gift. I can't use it. There's nothing good can come out of this sorrow. And I think there's people here this morning that can testify that there has been a lot of good come out of the sorrow that they have gone through. And I'm saying here this morning, there, there can a lot, a lot of good come out of this gift of sorrow. Those that have lost loved ones can sympathize with others that have lost loved ones in a deeper way. Those with health issues are able to reach out to others in a way a healthy person cannot. If I, if I haven't experienced a certain chronic illness, it's hard for me to just really, you know, know what to say to them. But if, you, if you're a person that has the same type of an illness, you can, yeah, you know, they, they can talk about it and they can understand each other. They can know what's happening. <clears throat> Some of the greatest hymns of the church have come from deep sorrow. Some of the strongest teaching and preaching in the church often comes from men who have experienced sorrow. You know, and it was sorrow that gave Jesus his rightful place at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews 12. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't think anybody has ever experienced that kind of sorrow as Christ did, and yet he came out triumphant. In fact, has a place at the right hand of the Father because of it because he was willing to accept that gift from his father instead of, you know, rebelling against that gift that God gave to him. He opened his hand, and because of his response, we in turn uh, are able to go, go through sorrow as well. Are you willing to open your hand to the gift of sorrow and allow it to consecrate your life to the building of the house of God, the church. And I, and not just that one, I, I, I don't want to just totally focus on that one, but I, I think some of the greatest uh, encouragement and building of, of the church has come from, from uh, that gift of sorrow. But the other gifts are just as important. They are very important as well. The gift of edification, the gift of encouragement, Sometimes you sisters might think that, oh, what, what gift do I have? Well, I want you to know that you probably have more gifts than, than the men do because of your relationship with your family. You have your, ch your children in your home and all of that. There's just so much you can do. Don't close your fist or hand to, to those gifts that God has given you as mothers. It can get, I'm sure it can get mon monotonous and, and lonely at home sometimes. But there is so much you can do. There is so much to help build the church. There is really so much, you, really a lot that you can do. <clears throat> Consecration is an act of the will. I choose to obey Christ and give back to him all that he has given me. And I, I hope that that be, can be your testimony as well. Anybody have anything they'd like to share? <clears throat>